you have your Bible now, you'll turn it to the fourth chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want to begin reading at verse 3 to get the setting for the text that we're going to use tonight, which is verse 7. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bond slaves for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And having this treasure in earthen vessels, this gospel, this having experienced the darkness done away with and the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, having shined in our hearts, having that wonderful treasure in these earthen vessels, not angels to preach, but sinful men and women who have been visited by the God of all grace and that in line with the purpose of God that the power should be in him and not anywhere else. And therefore, he's pleased to take weak earthen vessels and show forth his glory in the redemption of sinners. Having that wonderful treasure in these broken, sinful, marred bodies, we are troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are cut down, cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. The Apostle Paul is the believer's pattern. God said, I'm going to let him suffer to show a godless world how much a man can suffer for my sake. He's a pattern of the long suffering of a God who wills the salvation of this whole world. He's the pattern of everybody who's had the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ shining in his own heart. And he's the pattern of everyone who is as an earthen vessel, perplexed but not put out of business, persecuted but not in despair, forsaken and cast down but not utterly destroyed, always bearing in his body the marks of the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the pattern for us to study 
He's the pattern for us to use as we seek to witness a good confession of what the Lord Jesus is and has done for us. The Apostle Paul has a pattern. We might be helped tonight and encouraged if we notice five things about him. In the first place, this one who had all of this glory in his soul, and yet in this old earthen vessel, this apostle Paul had to pray for open doors. He had to pray for open doors. He never got a chance to witness except an answer to prayer for God Almighty to, uh, to lock the jaws of a lion on one hand and open a closed door on the, uh, on the other. And I am persuaded, my friends, that only those doors that are unlocked by the intercessory importunity of God Almighty's people, they just have to be open. We can't live without it. Only such doors uh, would avail us if we knocked it down. Nothing, if we push through it, would do no good. But those doors that God opens in answer to the cry of his people are the same kind of doors that Paul so successfully ministered the glory of Christ wherever he went. My soul, this world's not a friend to Christ. This world's not a friend to grace. We've heard it, we've heard it, we've heard it. Now we experience it. Men and women are not rushing to get a glimpse of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men and women do not sit at the feet of the Holy Spirit as he bears witness to Christ in the written word. We can't follow Jesus Christ around in the flesh. He's not here. But we can sit at his feet as the Spirit unveils the face of Christ to hungry hearts through his revelation of the word of the living God. Men are not doing that now. Men are not rushing. And the reason is they've been blinded. There's a great adversary of sinners. That man out town in the streets, not what he is just because he's a man. He's what he is because he's a man blinded by the God of this world. And the God of this world working 28 hours a day and in between time to see to it that men shall not see the knowledge come to see the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Paul had to constantly pray for open doors. If he's a pattern for believers, take notice if you're a believer. Paul's message was opposed by the religious people of his day. He never went anywhere and established a work on the rock Christ Jesus that soon men and women were not following in his wake to destroy everything he'd done. And if he'd just done it, they would have destroyed everything. We need to take comfort and consolation from the fact that there never has been a day since Jesus Christ hung on the cross when the religious world in any generation wasn't a bitter enemy of a gospel that gives glory to God and debases man. And we may not think that our, we've been just sidetracked in one day. There never was a time except in the days of the visitation of God Almighty in power when by the Holy Spirit he walked the streets and knocked on doors and rang doorbells and sent spiritual earthquakes when this whole world was interested in hearing the gospel of the grace of Almighty God. If you're a believer, try and go around to where you work and your next door neighbor to get in a word edgewise for the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Paul a pattern for you and religious people opposed his message and if your message is the message of conquering, redeeming, sanctifying keeping grace and reigning grace, it'll be persecuted, but persecuted
execute it too. I was speaking to Brother Everhard a moment or two this afternoon, and I told him that he sure and get all the tape he could for Brother Bright, that he was uh, having these tapes spread down in that country. And I told him about young preacher Dockery, wanting him to be certain to keep them so he could get them. But Brother Dockery takes these tapes, whether he can be here or not. And he sits, young guy, he gets off from Western Electric, and he'll sit there for an hour, and some of these tapes he'll play as many as 30 times, and he'll play them over and over again. And he says he gets to where he just shouts in, in victory. And then he told me today, he said, I take the messages of the tape, and I hear them, and I hear them, and I hear them, and I memorize them, and I weep over them, and I pray over them, and I go and preach them. And said, all hell busting loose out uh, where we are. And I brought that up to say this, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to Brother Barnett tonight. The only way on earth that people are being reached now is by going like this is and where they are. The church houses of this city are not full tonight. I know it's August. I know it's still vacation time. I know that people are everywhere now getting out of the hot weather. I know all that we're up against and I know further that God Almighty knows what's going on, and I welcome this ministry. I glory in this ministry. Tapes, I have tapes now, and I think about 30 uh, foreign mission fields, and missionaries take them, and preach them, and, and use them, and let them. I advise you, Brother Tim, to keep it up. Go into those colored homes. If they can't get people to come to hear people preach now, they're not interested in very much. That's true. But God's still on the throne. And we'll go in that door. And we'll go in that other door. And we'll slip up on this side. And we'll slip up on the other side. And God shall get to glory. And here shall be the victory. Ours is just to be good messenger boys for the Lord. Somebody says, People are not hungry. Well, nobody would make them hungry but my Lord. There's what it says. People are not thirsty. They're satisfied with having dug them out. The cisterns and drinking water out of wells. They've dug themselves. And they're not interested in the water that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. But oh, my soul, our business is not to find out whether men are hungry or not. Our business is not to find out whether men are thirsty or not. Our business is to get the word out. It's God's business. He's the only one that can create a thirst in a human heart. And our job is to do what he called us to do. But the message is hated. The message that humbles a man and exalts God. The message that trusts more in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has been entrusted with the welfare of the will and the prosecution of the good pleasure of a sovereign God. And that that will will be done because it's been left entrusted in the chosen anointed elected son of God who came down here to do a job and bless God come hell or high water in good times or out in seasons of refreshing or in the times when the rains do not come bless the Lord this hated message is in the good hands and the keeping of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was entrusted with the will of God to save a world, and I rejoice in that. Our hands, they're too feeble. Our hearts are too weak. We can't rule and love and win this generation, but we can take to them, whether they hear it or not, this hated message that caused the Apostle Paul to be hated and persecuted and not destroyed. If you're a believer and you're coming to see that the New Testament plan is not to get somebody to come to a place, but for God's people to go where sinners are and look for and pray for and enter in every door that God even opens a little bit for it a witness a good testimony of your gospel of what Christ has come to mean to you. That's your gospel. Not a message of theology, not to explain a doctrine, but to proclaim the gospel according to you. This is what Christ is to me. This is what Christ has done for me. It worked for me. 
And if it worked for me, it'll work for you. Paul has a pattern for every believer. Was a fool for Christ's sake. A plain fool for Christ's sake. You listen to me now. Take out of our organized churches today the businessmen that joined the church because it helped the business. Take out the rest of them that go for social purposes. Take out the rest of them who go because it's quite the thing to do. And keep on whittling it down. To just those who are willing and out on a limb so far, they are fools for Christ's sake. Fools for Christ's sake. Paul said, I'm a fool. We're fools. This world says they're crazy. Ah, my soul. He ain't talking much about us, is he? Huh? Fools for Christ's sake. As a pattern for believers, Paul knew the terror of the Lord. Paul said, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. I wonder what he meant. How did he know it? In what sense did he know the terror of the Lord? But he says it, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. We persuade men. I wonder what he means there. We plead with men. We warn men. We exhort men, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Paul knew something of what Noah felt. The scriptures say by faith. What does that mean? Well, God told him, and he believed what God said. By faith. Acting on what God said acting as if what God said was so by faith Noah being warned of God watch it of things not seen as yet moved with fear what moved with fear God's child, God's servant, yeah, you who live in a giddy age of easy familiarity with a God who's all love, yeah, what God showed Noah that was to come to pass, God, Noah, he moved with fear. of the whole way all settled on that man as with the eyes of faith that had seen God and had heard God speak he looked out thunder and never doubted that what God warned him would come to pass though it not yet come to pass that old man with a trembling step and with a broken awesome heart Moved with fear and prepared an ark. I didn't see him kneeling away. He's scared. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade me. And the fifth thing, Paul's our pattern. He witnessed with the judgment in view 
as a dying man to die in me. When I was a little teeny weeny boy. I used to hear the old white haired, white mustache, bearded preacher talk about preaching as dying men to dying men. I wonder what the men. After I got to be what they call a preacher, I used to read about the saint of Spurgeon. They claim he's the most influential Baptist preacher that ever lived. I guess so. I read about Brother Spurgeon preaching to more people than any man living in his day, writing books that are still read by millions everywhere. All the so-called Christian world admiring him, apparently except the preachers, and they all cussed him. I'd read where Brother Spurgeon would sometime go for three weeks at a time, just right in the pit of hell, where when people had come around him, in his awful depression. He didn't even wonder whether he knew the blessed Lord or not. I couldn't understand how a man that had the world at his feet could get so depressed as Spurgeon was. I read the life story of George Whitfield, perhaps the greatest preacher that ever walked on the shores of America. And I read how he'd come in from his preaching journeys. He'd go off in the room by himself and get out on his knees. He begged the Lord to be merciful to him and take him and let him go. Give him rest. How I've read it, marvel at what he said. Lord, the burden's so great can't stand up under it any longer. What you talking about? Oh, beloved, I'm not talking about a public preacher. All the days of your life you've lived, whether it's depending on public preachers to keep this world out of hell, and I'm trying every time I stand up and speak to her, Brother Grady to say, God called you to a ministry. God's called you, and God's called you, and you've got your gospel. You've got the gospel according to you, and you must witness it and confess it. A young man walked up to me in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I was preaching in the factory, and he said, Preacher, what do you do when you witness to a man that spits in your face? And I said, Oh, mean, hot-tempered rock barn would probably knock him down. What I ought to do if there's anything like the Lord Jesus Christ is to thank God for the privilege of having somebody spit on me when I talk about the Lord. Hear me tonight, my brethren. The unseen world aren't here. They're not listening to any man preach tonight. They're out having pleasure. But listen to me. Listen to me. Cry to God to give you and cry to God to give me something of that that made George Whitfield under the crushing burden of it. He can stand up and preach in a voice about a loud speaker to 20,000 people standing out in the cow pasture. His voice was so powerful that one time he broke up a county fair and the people left the fair to come to hear him preach. He lived in a day when the churches had no message for hungry souls. And he and Wesley had to get out on the hill topping in the pasture. But the bed, the bed of preaching the man who are headed for the judgment. That's what I'm talking about. Every man you see is headed for a meeting with God at his judgment. Every man. Every man you meet tomorrow. 
that the Lord let him be. My tender of the blood of the Son of God. In the ledger of Almighty God books, and that man going to meet God. Paul preached to men as dying men headed for the judgment. The Apostle Paul wasn't used of God to write, but he did sure knew about, and he had joined, as I want to urge you tonight, for you and me to join the Apostle John as a sovereign God who knows the end from the beginning. Had John look out and see that meeting place that all men must come to. And I think Paul saw it, and I want us to see it. I want to read you what John said, and then I'm going to make my message on just one thought. I want us to see it again. John says in Revelation 20, verse 11, And I saw, I saw a great white throne, and I saw him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And I was found no place to flee. That's a solemn passage of Scripture. That's a solemn passage of Scripture. And he said, I saw the dead. I saw them. I saw them. Now, if old John's the only one that sees, this won't help us. God had it put down here for us to make our own. I wish we could close the windows and lock the doors, and I had the power first for myself. And then for you, for us to stay here until we could say, I saw a great white throne. It's set. It's white because it's a throne of holiness. It's God's throne. And men are headed just as sprayed as a croaking thigh to a meeting of Almighty God around that throne. The dead, small and great, John said, and I want us to say it, I saw the dead. I saw him. I saw him. I believe God. I warned the things not yet seen like no eyes, but God said it. It's out yonder. The dead are going to stand before God. I saw him. And I saw the books when they were open. I saw him. I saw him. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead, God help us, were judged. What? The dead were judged. The dead were judged. John said, I saw it. I saw it. By faith, I saw it. I saw the dead. They were judged. They were judged according to a record that is kept. By Almighty God. I was preaching up in the state of New York. And one night, I either referred to or turned in the Bible and quoted Psalms 130, verses 4 and 5. And there was a young deacon in the congregation. The pastor had been telling me about him, how his heart went out for him. And I quoted by memory or read these words. But there, if, verses 3, If thou, Lord, shouldst him, A-R-K, mark iniquities. Suppose God did keep a pencil and mark down iniquities. Who shall stand? Who shall stand? That's law. And that's all 
will be in this record that men will be judged by at the judgment bar of God. Men are not going to be judged with what they did with Jesus at the judgment. Men are going to be judged by their deeds. Under law, sin is transgression of the law. This book is going to be a faithful record of a book keeping God. If thy Lord shouts mark iniquities, and I said that's the trouble. He does mark them. H. G. Wells is that it? H. G. or whatever his name is? H. G. Wells, who wrote that awful book, Knives in Hell, said that when he was a boy. They talked to him about a God who watched what we do and marked it down. And he came to hate with all the intensity of his soul a God that would keep a record of all he did. But that's what he does. That's what he does. This young deacon, as I was reading that, began to scream in the service came running down to the front, broke up my sermon, praise God. He said, oh my God, my wife don't know about it. My pastor don't know about it. This church don't know about it. But I see God keeping a record of it. And he stood there and spilled his awful tale of ungodly immorality, enough to make the devil sick at his stomach if he had a heart. God's Holy Spirit made alive and quickened to that young man this awful truth that God does mark down iniquities and they're being saved in the books and that men who come to stand before God are going to be judged by the record that a record-keeping holy God makes concerning the iniquities of men. Oh, my soul, brother, here I wish I could be believe that. You don't believe that, do you, sinner friend? You don't believe it. You don't believe it. I talked to a man that took me out to see him in another part of New York State. He said he never listened to anybody. He's a hired nut and wants you to go talk to him. And I went along. And I talked to him the best I could. And the man said, Now, have you understand, preacher? that I've had a terrible past, but he said, I've forgotten it, and that's the end of it. And I turned him to this scripture I'm reading to you now, and he said, oh, he said, that's just what the Bible says, but full on the Bible. I don't believe it, but not believing it won't change it. God does mark down a man's sins. Oh, and he keeps them in these books. And he says, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. My, that's an awful message carrying an earthen vessel, in it? Paul said, I carry this treasure in an earthen vessel. We're utterly insufficient for it. I wish I could say something that encouraged some child of God tonight to start looking at men with eyes that know they're headed for this judgment. I believe we'd plead with them more. I believe we'd be more earnest with them. I believe we wouldn't look for a doctrine to hide behind. Men are headed for the judgment. I think about some old people down Swanborough, Brother Tim Bryan is a bad religious leader. I never saw folks fight truth like they did. And how men blinded by the devil going about wreaking havoc against the church of God, sinning against the souls of eternity-bound men and women. Oh, my 
my soul. Those people are headed for a meeting with God. I cry to God to see a group of people dealing with unsaved men and women as you meet them. They don't believe it, but you believe it. They headed for the judgment. They going right smack dab toward a meeting with God. They don't believe it. They don't believe it. But then anything on earth is contagious as a man that believes something. There ain't anything on earth as contagious as a child of God that really believes something. And I wish for a brief moment now you'd sit and stand in the shoes of the Apostle John. And let me call your attention three things. First, he said he saw the dead stand before God. Before God. A holy God. A God that the Bible says hath eyes so pure that he cannot look on sin nor behold iniquity. A God that said the soul that sinneth it shall die. A God that said the wages of sin is death. A God that sets upon it unto man wants to die and after that the judgment. A God that commands people, be ye holy, even as I am holy. A God that won't settle for second best, it's all or nothing. A God whose holy day is a holiday, whose holy tithe is an excuse for sin, sinful people. I think of sinful men today. They respect neither God nor man. They rob God of his tithe. They rob God of this Lord's day. They rob God of the honor that's due him. They deny God the worship that's due him. They deny God the praise that's due him. And they're going to stand before God. And they're going to stand for a living God. Not a book of rules. Not a machine. Not a gadget but a living God. A God that knows every move you make and marks it down. And when I think on these things, my body tonight is utterly incapable of talking to you. No wonder George Whitfield Pray, oh God, kill me and take me on. Can't stand the burden any longer. No wonder the burden of preaching to the multitudes that Spurgeon had fit him into such terrible times of melancholy that he said all hope of his salvation would go away from him. I hear this generation of people wouldn't know God if they met him in the road. So I never doubt my salvation. Of course not, you ain't got none. If you had any, the devil would attack you, too. If you had something real, the thief would try to steal it, brother. And as long as you were in this old body, if you had a treasure from God in this old body, you know what it was to doubt. If you close your eyes some nights when sleep doesn't come, and hear the trap, the trap, the trap, the trap, the trap of the marching feet of eternity bound men and women. You and I have witnessed to look like it did no good. You and I have played with and did no good. My, that's enough to kill anybody. This earthen vessel with that treasure. I wish you'd see again what John said he saw, he said, I saw the dead stand before God. That's the doctrine of justification introduced for us, a big word. But there are just two ways a man can be justified in his own sight 
or in God's sight. When a man got to stand before God, John said, I didn't see him stand before a judge of their fellow church members. We'd, we'd make a lot of allowances one for another, wouldn't we? John didn't say, I saw him stand before the interpretation of the way to be saved that they heard. Or their understanding of it. And I saw the dead stand before God. Oh, my soul. How can a man be just before a holy God? How can a man be brought to the place that God declares that wicked sinful man to be not only as if he'd never sinned, but to be declared righteous and made righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. Man never faced a question as solemn as that. You'll never face in this life, you may not face it, but if you ever get honest with the need of your soul, You'll never face a question quite so solemn. How can I stand before God? How can I stand there? How can I stand there and be just, not in my sight, but in the sight of God? And John said he saw him cast into the lake of fire. Cast into the lake of fire. No man will go to hell willingly. I saw them cast into the lake of fire. Cast. In that awful language. Is that literal? You work it out for yourself. Is this a picture? I saw whosoever was not found written in the book of life. I saw him cast in the lake of fire. That boy of yours cast in the lake of fire. That girl of yours cast in the lake of fire. That fellow church member of yours cast into the lake of fire. My soul, John said, I saw that. There ain't no doubt about it. This is what God showed me. It's our chunk that's coming. When men are going to be cast into the lake which burneth with fire and stone. That's solemn thinking, isn't it? Brother Cox, you live over there in Reedville. Ain't enough gospel preaching in Reedville to save a flea. My heart goes out for you. Oh, my soul. Go down there and work in that ungodly factory. Well, people are going to be cast into the fire. God said it. John said, I saw it. It's so. It's so. My first pastorate, I think I told this before, you've forgotten it. I went to an oil town, started a church in a saloon. We built a little church house up on a hill, and then we went down the heart of the, the wicked oil city, bought an old skating rink, great big thing, seat a couple of thousand folks. And we had our Sunday night services down there, and the men would parade up and down the crowded streets on Sunday night. The oil workers come in to make whoopee, and they'd get everybody to come in to hear me preach they could. One night, a young man claimed the Lord saved him. And the next Sunday night, he brought his buddy to the service with him. They bumped together out the Marlin Oil Company camp. And he got his buddy to come along. <clears throat> Happened that night, I was preaching on something about the hell that awaits sinners. The two young men, one of them a week old, in the Lord, and the other didn't know the Lord. They sat there and sat through the service. We stood and had an invitation. After the invitation was closed, the young man who saved said, 
Lucky to go down and meet the preacher. The boy said, no, I don't want to meet him. He said, I wish you'd tell him we'd pray for you. He said, no, I don't want nobody praying for me. And uh, well, he said a week ago, I was in the same shape you were in, but said the Lord is precious to me now. And he said, I, I know he could be to you. I wish you'd let us pray for him. Ah, just go home. Walking along, they walked about a mile, get back to their bunks. The young man who didn't know the Lord said, I said, that hell bit. said, ain't nothing to that. said, that preacher's just trying to scare people. He said, if there's a God, I don't think there is, but if there is one, he wouldn't send anybody to hell. The young man who'd just been saved said, I don't know. I know nothing about that. All I know is I got the Lord in here now. He said, I don't even know whether the Bible speaks much about hell or not. All I've heard about is what I heard the preacher preach tonight. But he said, I got the Lord in here. And they walked on a little further. The young man got a little bold and he said, ah, he said that Bible. He said a lot of mistakes in that Bible. A lot of mistakes. He said, I just tear that Bible up. And the young man that he says, said, maybe you can. He said, I don't know. I haven't been reading it but a week since the Lord saved me last Sunday night. He said, all I know is I got the Lord here. And they walked on a little further, and the young man got a little bolder. And he said, this God business. I don't believe there's a God. He said, nobody ever saw him. That you can't prove there's a God. Well, that's right. There isn't a great truth that you've ever experienced that can be proved, can be experienced. He said, if there is a God, which I don't believe, that I just dare him. He don't like what I'm saying. Do something about it. And the young man who was saved, he said, Well, I sure wish you wouldn't talk that way. I'd be afraid to talk that way. God might take you up. Tom Alford was a song leader at our little congregation. And he is also the, the foreman of a gang of men that are working on a well and the next morning at 10 o'clock Monday morning this young unsaved man been so bold <coughs> the night before There's many mistakes in the Bible no hell didn't believe there was a God if there was he didn't like what he said you sort of damn do something about it went home that night slept like a log but he said, man in pretty hard shape, and he can do that. Man's a fool, he can hear about hell, not be afraid to go in there. Man's a big fool to dare a holy God to show his displeasure. And 10 o'clock the next morning, Tom Alford was superintending the work. They were doing something on a well. If you've ever seen the oil wells, the rigs that stand way up. This young man didn't know the Lord up in the top of the rig they were cleaning out the well doing something and a miracle took place an unexplainable thing happened they had an investigation afterward and with all their scientific ability they gave the verdict that what happened could not be explained and they could find no reason for it but all at once they had a an explosion in the bowels of that oil well and out of it came a great volcano of burning oil just one great flame of burning oil and it came with all the force of an explosion and just enveloped that rigging and in far less time than it takes to tell, that young man, who perhaps the last thing he'd said about
about God the night before, before he went to sleep, that there is a God which I doubt. He don't like what I say. I dare him to do something about it. There he was up in the top of the rigging, and is that awful volcano of liquid burning oil just gushed out of that well and surrounded and encompassed the rigging. Caught him, and the force of it was so great, he lost his hold. Just like that, he came tumbling down to bust out his brains on a piece of pipe on the floor. Tom Alford said that as he fell, I heard him say, Oh, God! And then his head hit the pipe, and he went out to meet that God. He dared to do something about it the night before. And every time I read this verse of Scripture, I think about that young man. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Beloved witness in the shadow of the judgment. witness was some of the the fire scorching your soul that men are going to face at the judgment. Let us stand. Opportunity of preaching over the radio at 8 30 today through the speaker. I felt the Holy Spirit indicted the message to hearts this morning. We've had the opportunity to worship our Lord around this table and to hear the Word of God expounded and tonight to sit here and have the challenge and the charge again. This old world full of people. They don't believe in the judgment. Witness to them, dear ones. Plead with them. Standing in the shadow of the judgment you know is coming because God said it. Snatching men as you can out of the very fires of hell. We're glad for the visitors who've been with us today 
come again as the Lord leads you. If you're not willing to go away in the shape you came, we invite you to come forward to close. And we'd like to pray with you and instruct you, help you, if we can. We can't save you. You can't save yourself. God's the Savior. Our Father, it's been a good day. We thank you that you've given us another Lord's Day to meet together and to witness. We bring this congregation, including this speaker, lay ourselves before you. My God, have mercy upon us. Burden us, break our hearts as dying men. We shall plead with dying men to repent toward God and flee toward the Lord Jesus Christ. All that's been done today, Lord, that's of us, please forgive it. And what's been done that you can get glory out of, thank God for it. We have to give an account to you for today, and we wait that time when your eyes shall scan our labors. Speak to hearts as they leave the tabernacle tonight, for Christ's sake. Amen.